Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Jimmy Scott Fitness Podcast Radio Show. Coming to you on this Wednesday, April the 10th, 2024. Hopefully it finds you staying safe and staying sweaty all at the same time. On today's episode, we are going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm actually just going to take uh, a question I got from Instagram, which I've gotten this probably a dozen times or so over the past year, and just uh, to, to save time in the future, it, this is just something where I can just redirect people to uh, what I would suggest for this. And it was just um, an individual reaching out to me, um, asking about uh, just kind of how to get out of debt uh, in the the specific situation that they're in. And I'm going to walk through uh, what I would do um, if I was in that situation myself. On top of that, in this episode, I'm going to talk about just generational luck um, in the housing market, a great article by Ben Carlson that someone had sent me, and just kind of go and give my overview of what I see uh, in the space in general. Now, if you want to look at this, you're like, why is this fitness dude, you know, talking to me about finances and and how to get out of debt? Uh, The reality is, it's the same. Um, How you get in shape, how you get, uh, you know, I guess physically fit is the same way you get out of debt and it's the same way you get uh, financially fit. They're very much interconnected. And for me, it's all just process and small daily habits that compound over time that allows you to get either, you know, the right side of wrong or obviously upside down, uh, you know, in your health, in your fitness, in, uh, you know, your weight, if you will, in your life and finances. I really think they are very much tied together. So that is what we're going to kick off uh, the episode today with, and uh, again, we'll kind of go down the rabbit holes as we go, but real quick before we kick off housekeeping stuff one, the Jeremy Scott Fitness app is live and rocking 24-7, 365. If you guys want to check out the link in the show notes, we'll give you a week for free. Uh, all my weekly workouts are in there, follow along flows. I think there's 14 different programs. They're just wrapping up their 30 for 30. The next one is the rebuilt program, which will be a premium option, um, and it'll be uh, offered at a discount to all app members who are inside to start, and then we'll release it to the general public. And this is something where if you're looking to kind of rebuild your body from the ground up, you know, you've had some injuries, maybe you're tight, you're stiff, you're busy with kids, a job, travel, you name it, this program is for you. You'll do things that you are not doing now. You're doing things that you should have been doing 10 years ago. Um, We'll rebuild you and try to make you bulletproof um, through injuries as you move forward in your life. It will be challenging, it will be tough, and we're going to touch areas of the body that I know you are not focusing on. And so that is coming to the app here probably in the next couple of weeks. So jeremyscottfitness.app, links in the show notes, get a week for free on me, and you can stand for a couple of pennies if you dig it from there. Also, AG1, the way I essentially revamped my supplement routine, if you will. This has been my foundational nutritional supplement for the past, I believe, seven years at this point. It didn't just replace the multivitamin. It's a simple scoop, or really what I do is I take the travel packs and I just throw it in water, shake it, and I slam it. It gives me my prebiotics, my probiotics, my digestive enzymes, the B vitamins I need, vitamin C, adaptogens, zinc, and also covers the gaps in my nutrition that I'm not eating through real food. Again, I eat real food every day. It's probably 98% of my diet, but I don't eat 10 to 12 servings of fruits and vegetables. I just don't have the time, and I don't think my digestive tract can handle eating that much asparagus, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, you name it. So I do the best I can. I eat the fruits and veggies that I like and enjoy that make me feel good, and then I cover the gaps in my nutrition with just a simple scoop or pack of AG1. So if you guys want to check it out, the link is in the show notes. It's drinkag1.com slash Jeremy Scott to get a year supply of free vitamin D and five free travel packs with order one. Now, if you want to try it 100% for free, you've heard other people talk about it on podcasts or maybe different friends at the gym or people you know, hit me up. We will send you a pack right to your front door. I don't care where you live. We'll give it to you for free. You can try it. If you like it, you can get hooked up with all the free stuff from there. For a lot of people, it's their morning ritual. It becomes just kind of like a, a, a timing habit they do, pre-workout, post-workout. It's just something that can support your immune health. And again, it really is like a foundational nutritional supplement. So if you don't want to take 15 different pills, this would be the one thing I would take and throw into your life each and every day. It's simple, it's easy, and in my opinion, 
it's the best tasting that's out there. So hit me up for the free samples. I'm happy to send them to you guys. Don't feel weird. That's why I offer it, and I'm happy to do it. Nobody else is doing that, uh, and we'll continue to do so as long as it helps you guys get a little bit healthier. But if you want to check it out today and just pick some up on my word, drinkag1.com slash Jeremy Scott will hook you up with all the free stuff with the first order you make. And last but not least, um, we do have a bunch of other sponsors in the show notes, you guys. Our friends that sleep sold separately, JLab Pro, or get our protein, turmeric, collagen, and krill oils. But we do have this mastermind group that we've been running for all of 2024. It's a group that I do with David DiLorenzo, who's built a you know multi-million dollar business on his own via uh, his insurance agency and personal branding and all those things. What we did was basically take our best practices, kind of marry them together, and then we coach you guys week by week. Actually, you have 24-7 access to us if you want to hop on a call, if you want to text us, if you uh, just have anything, we will be there for you. Um, the link's going to be in the show notes. It's jeremyscottfitness.com slash built-different-mastermind. Uh, it's uh, This is not a passive group. This is not a plug and play. It's not a set it and forget it. You're actually getting coaching by us. You can reach out to us. It's for entrepreneurs, the solopreneurs, the small to medium-sized businesses who are looking to just kind of level up, make more money for sure. And that's what we do is we help people improve the bottom line and, and create more wealth in their life, but also create the ideal life that you want, the amount of free time that you need, the amount of flexibility you need, what do you want your life to you know, maybe look like in 5 to 10 to 15, 20 years in terms of finances, in terms of freedom, in terms of career. That's what we focus on from two dudes who've been doing it for a long time and we're at the point where we can kind of give back to you guys and, you know, enrich your life in uh, more than just one way. So if you're interested, the link's in the show notes. You guys can apply. If you have questions, reach out to me, reach out to Dave. And uh, again, if you're, you're tired of corporate America or you're looking to climb the corporate ladder or build a side hustle or turn your side hustle into your main business or just elevate your main business from making 10K a month to 30K a month or 50K a month or 100K a month or whatever you need to do, we are here to help you guys because we have done it and we have lived through it and you can shortcut your way to success a whole hell of a lot faster with advice from people who have done it before. That's basically how I've done everything um, in my career, uh, both uh, business-wise and obviously finance-wise. I'm lucky enough to have hung out with a lot of people who have millions and millions of dollars. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have worked with people who have built really successful businesses. You know, if you want to call them the people who really go crazy money-wise, the jet people who actually own jets and don't just lease them, like we have those clients too. So uh, we're here to give that to you guys. And that really is kind of what the episode is about today. Just me kind of sharing uh, what I've learned through all the people that I've worked with and what I've seen work best uh, to get yourself out of a hole and build yourself up to create some financial stability and freedom in your life to uh, just do cool shit, you know, and uh, make things easier for yourself. Because it's easier, you know, to spend time doing mobility and working out and hiking and traveling when you have a couple bucks in the bank and you're not, you know, working just to live and, and drowning in debt and struggling and stressed out. Those things make you unhealthy. They really do. And I'm not saying, you know, be a money hungry person, but there is a, a tipping point of where you go from like struggling to you feel okay with it, which allows you to have um, some freedom, obviously, in your life and to just be a healthier person, sleep a little bit better, eat a little bit better, and just dedicate more time to the things that you feel are important. Uh, before I, I jump in right into that, um, Heather had sent me something the other day. I believe it was a post on Instagram from uh, like, you know, what is it, Delicate Hibiscus, I believe is the name of the account. And... Just a simple um, thing for people out there who are type A or overthinkers like myself who want to have this kind of sense of control over everything. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are that way. A lot of uh, high achievers are that way. And the quote is, stop clinging to specific outcomes. Allow your journey to unfold in unexpected ways. You might not even be able to conceptualize how good life can get for you and you limit access to those possibilities by rejecting results that don't align with your subjective version of how your reality, quote unquote, should be. Put in the work you feel called to do and just fall back. Open your mind and heart up to a wide scope of potential. Choose to flow with your life instead of applying force. That's how you reinforce alignment rather than entertainment of control-seeking ego. End quote. Again, just something 
really simple. You know, when you come to, to peace with the fact that we don't know everything and you can only predict the quality of outcomes based on your limited experience, it becomes easier to trust uh, a life far more promising than the one that you currently think exists. And you just have to kind of, you know, it's like, like Bruce Lee, just be water, man. Uh, you just got to be fluid and roll with it. And uh, obviously, we've all been in seasons of life, whether it's, you know, currently or in the past or, or what you will obviously navigate in the future of things that you can't control, where you did your best, you put yourself in a position to to be successful or to win or to come through or to graduate or to whatever it may be. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, sometimes it throws you a curveball and you just have to, uh, you have to adapt and adjust the best way you can on the fly. And I know that is not the answer people want to hear and it is not the easy answer to accept, especially if you're a person who has a plan and you have goals and you want to time things. And sometimes you just, it's not in your hands. And even if you do all the things right, it does not guarantee you win. It does not guarantee success and it does not guarantee it's going to work out. So you just have to just be fluid and and flow through it and put yourself in the best, you know, mental and uh, physical position to get through um, all the little roadblocks that uh, come along your way. So take that with you as you guys kind of go through the week. Uh, just be water, my friends. Um, it's the only way to do it. Now, before I jump into my just really quick tactical take on how to get out of debt when I share this specific um, story that I got on Instagram, we'll go over this individual's monthly expenses, the monthly income, what they have going on, and uh, what I would do if I was them and give a couple of scenarios. And if it's applicable to your life, um, by all means, you guys use it. But the article I did uh, get from one of our Sunday Metcon peeps it's just an article about uh, generational luck in the housing market. Uh, Chris Sadbury actually shot me this over. This was written by Ben Carlson over at uh, A Wealth of uh, Common Sense is the website. And uh, it's really just talking about the timing uh, with everything. And, I, and I've mentioned on this on this podcast before, you know, to, if, to be successful, whatever your measure of success is, there's a lot of factors that come into play. Hard work being obviously one of them. But there's a lot of people that work super hard and don't achieve shit. It's just the truth. There's a lot of people who work super, super hard and really just struggle to get ahead, especially if you look at um, underdeveloped countries or countries that are not uh, America, that don't have access to the same upward mobility um, that we have. They just work really hard their whole life and they never really, they can't change stations. They can't kind of get past whatever, you know, quote unquote financial or social class that they're in. And when you look at the generational luck in the housing market, timing is everything. And I think that with all ultimate success, you have to have timing, uh, genetics, hard work, and influence all really play a factor. And one of the most important ones, and that's why I talked about, you know, just being water and flowing, especially with things that you can't control, it's it's the housing market. Um, it's the financial markets. It's the timing. It's the, You see the memes all the time where you get the boomers um, kind of talking shit um, to the young millennials and those kids, you know, hey, if you guys just would stop drinking $6 coffees and, and buying, you know, avocado toast, you could afford a house, which is complete fucking horse shit, right? And, it, and it's from a position of, uh, like, privilege. It's, it's a position of lucky timing and it's a position of someone who's already done it and not saying that they didn't work hard, but you have to, you know, call a spade a spade. Uh, you played in a different game than these young kids are playing in. And I'm not saying you should go buy $6 coffees if you're in debt up your ass. And if you are buying, you know, $10 avocado toast, but you can barely pay your bills, you're being an idiot. However, I don't think by you saving, you know, $14 a day or $16 a day, that's going to make or break the difference of most of you actually buying a home in the current market that it's in, especially if you didn't own any property or have any investments that moved with inflation prior to 2020. And that's what I'm going to talk about here real quick before I talk about the getting out of just straight debt. And the way I describe it to people, especially even my circumstance and situation, many of you know my story and how I kind of came through all of this. I graduated college in like that kind of 2005, 2006 timeframe. Shortly after the world starts melting down and eating shit, 
I just lived fiscally responsible enough, meaning I had a couple of thousand of dollars in the bank because I never bought anything um, to where I could buy. You know, my first property and the guy before me had to essentially foreclose on it. And every property I looked at in that 07, 08 time frame was a foreclosure or a short sale. Rarely did I look at a home that somebody else had lived in. So we were buying things for pennies in the dollar. If someone bought something for 300000 you were buying it for like $100,000 or less. It's a pretty sweet deal. That's the time that I came up in. That's how I could buy, obviously, my first place. And even from there, when I bought my you know, primary residence, we were buying it right before you know, it really kind of just jumps off, You know, well over a decade ago. And the same way I bought the commercial building that Jeremy Scott Fitness actually sits in, I bought that thing about seven years ago. So way prior to the 2020, 21 jump. Now, if I was just 10 years younger and graduated college instead of 2005, like 2006 timeframe, you're talking 2015, 2016. Now that same property I first bought, uh, the first condo that allowed me to get into the real estate game probably is two times or three times the price. And then if you push that window even back, and then now I'm buying my home in that kind of, you know, probably 20, 2021 time frame, my, no, my primary home is probably, I don't know, four times the price. And then the commercial space that I bought is probably 5x the price. And now all things equal, even if all the timing worked out and I met all the same people at the same time, and I got to work with all the major brands that I've worked with, and I, and I got to have influence from the BJ Gadours of the world and the David Jacks of the world and uh, meet these successful business people all at the same time, I wouldn't be able to replicate what I did. It's, it'd be impossible. It would not be possible for me because the, the price and the barrier for entry is much too high. So I, I can sit here and I'm going to give advice on what I would do and obviously walk through what I did. But I was playing, this is how I describe it to people. I was playing in the NBA against Bob Cousy. And not that Bob Cousy wasn't good, but that's who I competed against. And the kids nowadays are competing against LeBron. It's a much harder game. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, you have more access to tools and technology and information that we ever had, but so does everybody else. And so it's like the Warren Buffett quote, you know, you're all at a parade and then you stand on your tiptoes. Well, if everybody does, it really is no advantage. If you're the first person to stand on your tippy toes, yeah, you get a better view and you get more opportunity. Now the, the playing field is just, it's escalated. And I don't think the prices increasing are good for anybody across the board. So I, I share all that just because I, I like to be transparent. I know a lot of people don't. There's people out there who their parents gave them, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars and they bought their fucking house for them or paid their cars off or bought their, you know, college for them. And that's all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I go, but to not share that as part of the story, I think does people a disservice. So again, I don't come from money. Nobody gave me any money. I had to figure all this shit out the hard way. Uh, all my dad ever really told me was, hey man, d don't don't be a dumbass with your money. You go to your job, then you come home, you pay off your debts, you pay off your bills and what you owe. If you have anything left, you save it or invest it. That was pretty much it. He's like, you don't use a credit card and buy shit you can't afford. That's pretty much the only financial advice I ever got from a, you know, lower middle class family who just, you know, had enough money to make ends meet. The only lucky thing that I received is just the timing. And timing can be everything. And if you look at what's going on in the world today, um, inflation's through the roof. The, the shit is wild. I don't know how they put the genie back in the bottle. I don't really think there is any way that they can, not to be a, a doomsday person. But when you understand that you can just print money um, at any point in time, um, and they're not going to, you know, default on the money. They're not going to let the, you know, house of cards collapse, if you will. They're not going to pay the debt back. The only option they have is just to print more. And that's where they're just kind of forcing you to invest in things that move with inflation. And for a lot of people, the most expensive thing that they own and one of the biggest things they do is is just buy a primary residence. Most people don't get into multi-rental, multi-family, commercial, real estate, um, so this is how they're actually building wealth and moving up. And it's really tough because millennials um, in that kind of age group graduated into the shit of the great financial crisis. The labor market um, stunk um, and not just for a short while. The unemployment rate in America, nearly 7% from probably 2006 through the end of 2015. Um, 
I lived through this too. I went to like 50 job interviews and really nobody wanted to hire me fresh out of college. And it was hard to find work and it's hard for young people to find work. And I don't mean that like you can go find a job. It's just a really tough job or a shit job or a part-time job and you just have to be willing to eat shit. And sometimes that's part of the game. Um, but if you do find something, it's probably not something you wanted to do. And there's a lot of, you know, the saying going around, well, just be happy you even have a job right now. And and again, at, at first that is helpful advice and everybody has to kind of pay their dues and work the way up the ladder and and, and crawl and scrap and, and grind. And I'm okay with that. Um, but it's hard for, for a lot of people to just get started. Um, and it is hard to change jobs up front when you weren't happy. Um, and it was hard to make more money. Um, but back then, you know, if you're talking 15 years, not 15 years ago, yeah, probably 15 years ago, um, even 10 years ago, houses were cheap. Borrowing rates were also cheap. And if you earned a decent living as a young person, you could afford a house um, and finance it at a low rate. And for the Gen Z kids, um, the complete opposite, right? Like, lived through the strongest labor market in decades. The unemployment rate has been historically low. And people changing jobs have seen the largest kind of gains over those past couple of years. And the problem is... Right now, if you're sitting there and you're somebody who doesn't own anything, you're kind of screwed if you didn't get lucky enough to buy a house before, I mean, 2022, but really before, really before 2020, there was a massive jump. Housing prices are are high relative to the past. Financing is also way more expensive right now. So if you don't own anything... It's kind of like a double whammy of, of higher housing prices and higher borrowing costs, and that happened way too fast. The days of the 3% mortgage rates and, and low housing prices um, are still fresh in your brain, uh, but I don't know if or when they ever come back. Now, imagine you're like a, a Gen Z person, right, with a good job who makes decent money. Does like a super strong labor market make you feel better about how out of control housing prices have gotten the past few years? Probably not. So there's people making 100K right now who can't really afford a house in a lot of these cities and the places that they live in, and that's fucked up. Um, I didn't live through that. That's why I say it is much harder right now. And how do you compete in a housing market with baby boomers who are buying houses in cash, right? And elder millennials who are sitting on boatloads of home equity who can trade up if they need to, and you don't have anything. Now, house pricing gains have been so strong since the pandemic, they're almost going to be a disadvantage relative to those who kind of hit the housing lottery. And it's not like people who bought a house pre-2020 um, were way more financially savvy. They just got lucky with timing. And so that's what I mean. Like we have to be transparent with people and it, it is a, a much harder road. And if you take a look at the 20 years of, of the U.S. housing pricing returns from like 2004 to 2023, you'll see this monster gap, right? Like if you go back to like 2004, 2005, no, I didn't own properties then. I bought my stuff like 07, 08 is when I was picking up properties. Now you look at the returns those years, it's like negative 5%, negative 11%. There was these negatives during that time frame. It's the only time where you saw like annual housing returns lower. So people were upside down in their houses. They had these huge payments, they lost jobs. That's how you could pick up properties if you had money. Now, if you look from there, Increases in in uh, kind of your housing returns, 6%, 10%, 5%, 4%, and so on. Then you get to 2020. It jumps up to 11%, and then 2021, 19%, and then back down to 5%. So if you didn't own anything prior to that 2020 time frame, that's like a 30% increase in pricing, which is crazy. And that's why I would say, you know, you know, my neighbor a couple doors down, he's 98 years old, he bought his house for... I don't know, eighteen or nineteen thousand dollars. Now you can barely buy a a used Toyota Camry for that. And so, yeah, he made less money. And you're buying the, that same house now, even if he did nothing to it, and he's two doors down from me. And if it's the original house, you probably could get it for, I don't know, seven hundred thousand. So you're talking a nineteen fifty nine house, which he probably does not built addition. So the thing is probably thirteen hundred square feet, three bedroom, two bath, no pool. Um, nothing for seven hundred plus thousand dollars, and he bought it for nineteen. That's some wild shit. 
where you probably could have bought it in 2019 for 400000 or less. That's insane to me. Um, the crazy thing is there's kind of nothing going on at the tail end of like if you look 202010 um, that would have altered the market. Certain areas of the country have, have seen real estate explode obviously much higher, Scottsdale being one of them. Um, obviously, a person who bought real estate like in Scottsdale or Boise or Austin or Miami in 2017 didn't know the pandemic would cause the biggest housing you know, price increase and move in history. But you got lucky. That's all there is to it. And again, I'm not saying you didn't work hard. I'm not saying there isn't circumstance you know, that, that you put into play. But you have to admit timing is a real thing. And you look at the 30-year mortgage rates, um, they came down to what was the lowest, like 3.1%, 3% in like 2021. And now you're looking at probably 6.8% as of today. So um, again, when your parents are like, well, my first home loan was for 14%. I'm like, yeah, but your house cost $22,000 fucking dollars. Like the rate, it, it mattered, but it, it, it wasn't going to choke you out. Now for these guys, you're going to go buy a house for you know, seven hundred thousand dollars at six percent. You're paying five, six thousand dollars a month for a house payment, and most normal people have zero chance to do that. And that's what I mean is there's this generational luck that's going on. Because if you look at like the Great Financial Crisis, actually, you know, it kind of gave falling housing prices and falling mortgage rates for a long period of time, and that's a good combination if you have enough income to afford a house but not great if you can't afford one. So it's like the, you'll also see the memes where people are like, well, I should have been buying properties instead of being in sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade. Again, timing, age matters. Uh, the pandemic gave us rising house prices and rising mortgage rates, and that's pretty good. If you already own a home, it's pretty good. If you already, again, I don't think it's great for anybody. Honestly, I think it's all fucking stupid, and I think it screws everyone, um, if you want me to be honest. Um, it looks great on paper, right? You know that, like, if it's for me, right? Like, I'm a, just a, a, a dummy fitness gorilla in a warehouse that I own millions of dollars of real estate, right? Super cool. Well, well how, do you, how do you go to the next thing, right? Unless If you don't want to pull out all the equity you have, how do you go to the next thing? Because the prices have increased so much. Like that's the hard part, and if you and if you didn't own anything, you can't even get in the game. That's kind of like that's why I don't think it's good for anyone. And the the Gen Z uh, people are going to hate the millennials who bought houses just kind of in the nick of time, you know, because all things aren't equal. And millennials have have spent years, you know, claiming baby boomers ruined everything, and we're just lucky. Well, you're becoming your parents, my friends saying the baby boomers ruined everything, you're almost in the same boat. You know, the hard part is there's so many huge macro shifts that are all about luck and timing. And we go looking for narratives after the fact that make it seem like it was all kind of preordained, short of the government mandate to build more houses and offer 3% mortgage rates, which is never going to happen. I'm not sure what can be done to kind of level the playing field for younger people in the housing market. You know, uh, the Gen Z kids just caught a bad break, um, and it's a real bad break. And I don't think it's good. And it, you ha you're going to have this generation of people who essentially did everything right, um, and they got fucked. You know, hey, go to school, take out the debt for your um, your college education, um, and then they got you know a car payment, and then they're going to try to buy a house, and it's like. Well, they're making $88,000 a year and they went to school for this degree, but they owe $50,000 in student loans and they have, you know, probably a car payment. And now they're trying to buy a house for $500,000 as their first property when most of us, our first properties, if you're over 40 years old, cost nowhere near that. And the thought of, if, if you guys have to go back and remember yourself at that age, like I remember buying my first condo being super fucking nervous, but I'm like, well, it's re it's less than my rent is. So I think even if I, you know, had to get a job and work at Walmart, I can still pay for it. Like that was my thought process. The same thing when Heather and I bought our house, we're like, holy shit, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, how are we ever going to pay for this? And I was like, well, the payment is this. And even if we both suck at our jobs, we could work somewhere and still pay it and have a place to live. And obviously things have, you know, changed for us financially. We've been, you know, very blessed and, and lucky to be in the situations we're in. And I felt the same thing when I bought, you know, commercial real estate. 
But if I was to look at it today, those numbers are gnarly high and wages have not moved with those prices. And that's a tough spot to be in. So bring me full circle here to the question I got um, from this individual about how does he get out of debt? He feels like he's living check to check. He's super stressed and just doesn't know how he's going to be able to make it. Now, one, this person is paying rent um, and doesn't own a property. Um, I don't know the age, but if they're younger and they're trying to you know, have some upward mobility, these are the things I would suggest. So if you're listening at home, the monthly income is $2,800. This person makes $2,800 per month. Their monthly expenses, they pay $750 a month in rent, which honestly, um, I know sounds crazy. That would be impossible in Scottsdale. I have kids that work for me that pay shit over $2,000 a month. But in fact, the last couple of people who have worked with us, um, young dudes, uh, late 20s, early 30s, have paid north of $2,000 a month for rent, whether it's a one bedroom or two bedroom or whatever it may be, which is fucking insane to me. But this individual, is making 2800 bucks a month. They have 750 for rent. They have a truck payment that's 450, wild. Cell phone bill of $40, which is actually crazy cheap cuz mine's like 100 or some. Um, groceries at 300 bucks, also crazy to be able to do it for that. Gas at 250, car insurance every 6 month about 100 bucks. Um, and this person just feels like they are barely making ends meet. If you add up the total, that's just about two G's. If they make 2,800 bucks, plus the other things, you're probably able to, to bank and save about 200 bucks per week. Now, the other note is this individual is upside down in the truck and they owe more than the truck is worth. Again, no judgment here from anybody, uh, but new vehicles for most people, in, in my opinion, until you're a millionaire, are a complete waste of money. I would never do it. Buy something used. And even then, when you're a millionaire, buy used stuff unless you really want something new or the pricing makes sense or you just don't want to deal with maintenance and those things because you have the money and who really gives a shit. But if you can't light that money on fire and not have it bother you, I wouldn't spend it on a vehicle. It's a depreciating asset. It goes down in value. Things with motors and wheels typically do unless they're super rare or, you know, those unique vehicles. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about daily drivers here. So what I would do, obviously, um, I don't have a perfect answer for everything. One, save what you can, um, build an emergency fund, you know, of, you know, six months of expenses, at least I'm a person who likes to have a year's worth. Some people say three months, some people say six, some people say a year. I err on the side of a year that takes time. Obviously, invest your money into the market, whether it's an S&P or if you have a brokerage account or if you have an investor, I think it's smart to start saving because the, the compound effect, uh, making money on your money is real. But if you're not even in that position yet, just build an emergency fund. In terms of this person individually, if this is a position you're in, I think you're doing great with all of the things other than the truck payment. That is the thing that is fucking killing you. I don't know how upside down in your truck you are. I don't know how much money you have saved. If possible, um, and the number is not too big, sell the truck, take the financial hit, pay the difference if you can, and buy something cheaper, if possible. Even if you have to have a truck for work, get a cheaper truck, man. Like, you don't have to. Again, I get it, man. I, we haul a lot of shit. We do a lot of work. I got an F-150. Um, it's great. It's big. Uh, but it's also, well, what is it? 20, it's 11 years old. Um it, dri it, dri dude, it drives just as good as a brand new um, F-150 Limited would drive. And I just got the FX4. It's great. It's, it's big. It's roomy. I can haul shit everywhere. It's fine. I would trade in your vehicle to get a cheaper truck. If you don't need a truck, get a Honda Accord, dude. I still got an 08. It's great. Um, if you could get a, a, a Camry or something just cheap and durable. If you need a truck and you can work with a little one, just get a Tacoma. You know, this thing's little taco truck, like they, they work, man. They really do. Um, you got to get out of that, that truck payment um, and get that payment down. If, if you could get your, if you had no payment, that's 450 extra bucks a month. That changes your life. And making $2,800 a month, 
If you can get rid of that 450, that'll change your life. You get that 450 down to 150, even that 300 bucks a month, that changes a lot of things. It gives you breathing room for sure. Obviously, creating more income is always going to be helpful. If you could start a side hustle or a passion project, I don't think your other expenses really sound crazy to me. But you have to be able to a either save more money or generate more money. One of the two. Um, if you can look for a second job, if you can do side jobs and those things, that's helpful. But just getting rid of that, you know, dead weight around your neck of the truck payment will change everything. Because right now, if this person makes twenty eight hundred bucks a month and they're spending just about two thousand dollars a month, they're only saving eight hundred a month. To have another four hundred fifty dollars a month, that's everything. It's it's all percentages to me, and that's kind of how I look at stuff. And so sometimes you got to do things you don't want to do. Um, and you got to do the hard things. And a lot of times there's not an easy answer. And when the answer is as glaring as that, and you can look at it, that's really the only option. Um, short of making more money uh, and getting a new job or starting a second job, just getting rid of the, the current debts that you're in. And again, if you guys want to go kind of the, you know, the Dave Ramsey route in terms of paying off debt, you know, pay off the ones he does smallest to largest, you know, to create momentum and kind of have that snowball effect. I'm not against that, but I also look at the ones that are, what, what percentages are they, right? So if you owe on a vehicle for sure and you can dump it because the interest rate is probably higher, that's the one I would get rid of first versus like a student loan, which is probably a fixed rate and the rate is probably lower for people out there. But that's the number one thing. One, you have to do a P&L sheet every month. What do I make? And what comes out? What unnecessary expenses can I cut and get rid of that are bleeding me dry? And then what are the big glaring things I don't want to admit to that are really fucking weighing me down? And a lot of times it's the vehicle payments or it's the the home payments for sure. And sometimes it can be all the little things that stack up. But for most people, it's just they don't budget worth a shit. They don't forecast for things. They don't quote unquote save for a rainy day. They don't have three to six months of expenses saved up. And you have to do that. If you have six streaming services right now, do you need all six? And I know that it's not going to make or break your day, but if you could cut down and save an extra hundred bucks a month, that's 1200 bucks a year, or that goes towards paying debt or that goes towards uh, your retirement or investing, I think that's helpful. And as crazy as that is, man, just a hundred bucks a month over the course of 20 years does add up. But for a lot of people, the best way to do any of these things is just to slightly increase your income and get rid of this debt that is basically um, just drowning you. And I know it's tough, man, when you have all the things. And so you're going to have to live a certain way for a certain period of time that you might not want to. You might have to go cheaper on certain things. You might not to be able to do the certain lifestyle things you want to do right now. But if you could do that and commit to get rid- getting rid of that shit or maybe working the extra hours or doing this for six months to a year... If that six months to a year of work can change the next 10 years of your life because it allowed you to erase this anchor around your neck, I say it's worth it. And again, nothing is promised. You know, everything's temporary. We could, you know, it, we could be dead tomorrow. But statistically speaking, the odds are that that's not going to happen. So what I would suggest is just putting in the work today and getting rid of the debt that you can. Um, any way that it can be feasible. And you might not be able to get rid of the truck today, right? Like maybe you owe six grand on it. You're, you're six grand upside down and you only have $5,000. But when you can save up, you know, to get, I don't know, $10,000, pay off the truck and then have, you know, five grand to buy a vehicle or something like that, or put a down payment on a much cheaper vehicle, that might be the option. But side hustle, increased income, get rid of the truck payment. And for everybody out there, I'm not against debt. I know sometimes people get hear me get on here and say, well, Jeremy, you know, that's not realistic. I have to go in debt for my house because I'll never save up enough cash to buy one. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm not even saying you have to do that for your car. If you can, great. Um, but if you're going to leverage debt, I say do it for things that appreciate over time historically and things that move with inflation and go up in value versus go down in value. That's the thing that's going to get you through. Things that build equity, not things that erode in it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So if you're somebody who wants to buy a rental and you have to take out a loan for it, and it makes fiscal sense because that rental cash flows, so your your rental 
let's say uh, mortgage is fifteen hundred bucks a month, but you can long term rent it for twenty five hundred bucks a month. I'm cool with that. There's a, obviously there's a cash advantage to doing that. You're going to make money over time. And as long as, again, you treat it like a business, it's a P&L sheet. What's coming in? What's going out? Do I have emergency expenses in case I don't have renters or things break or go wrong? I think that's totally fine. And that's cool to do. If you want to buy a multifamily, if you want to do commercial real estate, that's fine. But taking out massive amounts of debt for certain things, again, that's why I think college has become a racket. It's a whole different podcast altogether that really is just drowning people. And it's I don't know if the juice is worth a squeeze for many people now, unless you're going to become something specific, but there's a lot of money to be made in trades. There's a lot of money to be made in entrepreneurship and with AI, who knows where things go. Um, I don't know what I'll be doing in three years or five years or 10 years with the way technology is moving so fast and it doesn't just grow you know, at twice the speed. It's like this exponential growth. And I don't think any of us know where you know, the AI robots take us other than Skynet when the Terminator comes to try to, you know, kill us and we have to fight with John Connor and the resistance to make it through. But all jokes aside, I don't know. The one thing I do know is if I had massive amounts of consumer debt, whether it be a house and vehicles and, um, you know, credit cards and student loans, it's not a place I want to be in. Uh, all I really defer to is the sleep at night test. And I, You know, I got enough problems in my life as it is. I got a lot of things that go wrong. I run businesses and I got to fix things all the time. And I have, you know, a real family and a real life and there's people around and you're responsible for people and you're dealing with things and it gets stressful, dude. Life is, is, it moves really fast these days. It's really busy. It's really hectic. And I sleep better at night knowing I don't have a bunch of debt weighing me down and I don't have to just live to work and I don't have to just go to work just to pay bills. I got bills like everybody else does, you know. I actually just did all our taxes today and I got a lot of money going out back to the Arizona Department of Revenue and the United States Treasury. Um, It's not fun. Those things will never go away, but your car payments can go away. Your student loans can go away. Your giant mortgage can go away. Um, You just have to be really diligent about it and just live you know, in your percentages, live within your means, know how much debt and risk you're willing to take on. And if it's affecting how you sleep, if it's affecting how you take care of yourself, it's affecting your relationships and your happiness, you got to find a way to let that shit go. I say this here all the time, like, don't do the keeping up with the Joneses. Nobody gives a fuck what anybody else is doing, and you shouldn't either. I don't know what their circumstance and situation is. Maybe they had boomer parents who gave them a house or gave them money or bought them cars or paid for their school. Everybody's circumstance is different, and we all didn't start off on you know, third base. Some of us had to start off on second and first and home and just get a hit as opposed to just starting off with this massive head start. So you can't play, play the comparison game. You will lose every single time. It will drag you down. You just have to do what makes you feel best for you and do the things that motivate you and make you happy internally versus, you know, externally. So to all the young people out there, there's going to be a crack in the game. Um, I want to say that. I don't want to be this, you know, kind of doomsday episode like you're completely screwed and you're never going to be able to to get ahead because I don't believe that's true. But it is much harder for you right now. And I think your path is much harder because of the the fiscal choices that um, the government has made and uh, the printing of money has really devalued the U.S. dollar so much and that has decreased your purchasing power. And so when I was, you know, and I always go back to this, when I was a kid, I could ride my, my bike to the local gas station convenience store and uh, I could buy Tootsie Rolls for a penny and... Uh, the Bazooka Joe bubblegum that had the little comics in it for five cents a piece. And I think uh, a 20 ounce uh, Mountain Dew was like a dollar. That shit's gone. And those might sound like trivial, stupid things, but those things should not be way more expensive today than they were back then. They should be the same price or cheaper because it's cheaper to produce them. Or it should be cheaper because technology tends to make things cost less versus cost more. A giant, you know, 60 inch flat screen, or excuse me, a giant 60 inch TV 15 years ago was probably $6,000. Now you get a giant flat screen with the same, you know, inches for probably $600. 
technology should move the price down, but our decision making has driven the price up. And so everything in life is more expensive and the wages have not increased with that. And that makes it harder for you young people out there. But there will be a crack in the system. There will be a crack in the game that you can take advantage of. That much I promise you. When it happens, I don't know how much it happens. I'm not sure. But in the meantime, all you can do is just work as hard as you can, um, create as much uh, financial stability in your life, get rid of as much debt as possible, save as much as you can, uh, invest as much as you can. And just when the opportunity comes, you're the person who doesn't have a bunch of debt and you have money on the side and you can actually strike um, and take advantage of it. And then you can move yourself up in the game. And so I think that all starts with getting yourself out of as much, you know, bullshit, bad debt as you can. And if you're going to be a, a, a leverage debt person, leverage it in a way that helps your life versus hurts your life. And that's, again, investing in things that move with inflation and go up in value over time versus things that lose value um, as you go. Just because I know when the juice is running, man, and in, in inflation is high and you're paying 3%, 5%, 6%, 7% or more on credit card debt, student loan debt, um, car payments, it's really hard to get ahead, especially if you're only getting a 3% merit increase at your jobs. If you're making 100 k a year, they just gave you $3,000 more, but by the time they tax it, you know, it's probably, I don't know, 1800 bucks. So what are you getting? An extra 150 bucks a month? At the end of the day, that really doesn't do shit. So you're going to have to do some extraordinary things if you want extraordinary results. And I'm not saying that, you know, the boomers didn't, and I'm not saying, uh, you know, people my age or a little bit older didn't, but it was a different game for sure. Um, and on the same note, if if I didn't have money saved at, at the times when I could buy things, I would have got screwed too, and I would have kind of got uh, left behind. And you don't really know when those historic things are going to happen, and all you can do is your daily practices to put yourself in a position to be successful. Spend less than you make. Um, don't buy shit you can't afford. And live your life. Have fun. But understand that you're doing some stuff today that the future you is either going to thank you for or scream at you for. And that goes with everything in your life. That goes for your, your financial um, health and also your physical health. The things that you eat, the mobility that you do or don't do the workouts that you do or skip, the steps that you didn't take or didn't take today, um, the food, everything that you're doing, how you sleep, it all affects you today, but more importantly, it affects you down the road. The compound effect is real. And so for most of us, there's never going to be a lottery ticket moment. It's just a small daily habits and practices that we put into place that make us more flexible, that make us more aerobically fit, that make us stronger, that make us leaner, that make us more financially stable, or that make us overweight, that make us go into debt, that make us, you know, move and feel like we're 30 years older than we actually are. Again, there's no magic answer. Hopefully that helps some of you guys if you find yourself in a tough position and you're currently, you know, in debt and, and you don't really see a way out. There is a way out. It's not an easy answer. It's stuff that you already know, but really just start looking at your expenses and start looking at your income and can you increase the income and can you do things to get rid of some of the unnecessary debt hanging around your neck and start having your money work for you. Because if you have to go to work every single hour of your life to, to make money um, and be rich, you'll be working until you're dead. You really will. We're, we're done with the days of where you can just go to a job, you know, at the Ford plant and have a wife and, and two kids and, and a vehicle and, uh, and, and make it without saving, um, or not even saving, because you used to be able to probably just to save money and make it. Now you have to invest. You've created a system where you, people are forced to gamble. They have to invest in the market. They have to invest in crypto or real estate or you name it. Because if you don't, your your, your money is just less and less and less every year. Um, just because of how inflation works and the, and the printing of money, your $100,000 today, you know, is probably the equivalent, you know, I'm sure if your parent, you know, if your parents made probably like 30 grand, you know, in 1985, you probably have to make like 150 today to, to have it be the same like purchasing power, if that makes sense. And so that's what I mean. You can't just let even the, the, the smallest amount just keep going towards interest payments of debt. You have to really start taking that money and investing it so you're getting five or six or seven or eight percent on your money versus paying 
five or six percent on the money. Does that make sense? So instead of paying five percent in interest to someone else, you want that five percent to start compounding and paying you each and every single year. That's how you do it, my friends. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, for those of you who have reached out and asked the questions, again, not sexy, um, but just simple stuff. Uh, if you need anything else, obviously feel free to reach out. I'm happy to, to share my take. And so there is going to be opportunity for people coming up. I do think with credit card rates being at an all-time high, savings rates being at an all-time low, uh, the interest rates being where they're at and the home prices being as high as they are, I do think there's going to be some things that crumble and fall. And I know people say, well, Jeremy, these people have interest rates on their homes at, at 3%. I get that. But everything else in your life is going up. Just because your mortgage rate is fixed, nothing else is. If your air conditioner dies or your heating unit dies, it's way more expensive now than it was three years ago. Your groceries cost more. Every service you pay for costs more. Your gas costs more. Your insurance, if you check, it costs substantially more. All those things are going up. And so if so, if somebody in the household loses their job or isn't getting pay increases, even if their quote-unquote housing price is fixed, which they're probably barely affording that, everything else goes up. And if you can't afford it, you're forced to sell or move or do something different um, and probably at a lower price than you want because the frenzy of buying a house in two days is over. That, that shit's not happening right now. So you young people, if you're lucky enough to be saving money right now and having it on the sidelines, your opportunity is going to come. You just got to be smart about it, uh, and you got to be ready to pounce when uh, when you see the window and opportunity. So take that with you this week, everybody. If you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate you guys as always. Thank you. Everybody else, if you have a question on the Jeremy Scott Fitness app, if you want a free sample of AG1 or any of the other discounts on uh, the uh, products and the, and the programs we work with, I'm happy to offer them to you. Just please reach out to me. I'm happy to, uh, to assist. And again, if you guys are looking to change careers, uh, move up the corporate ladder. If you're an entrepreneur, solopreneur, small to medium-sized business owner, and you want to be part of our mastermind group and not only create more wealth and financial stability and freedom in your life, uh, reach out. The Build Different Mastermind group is going to be for you. And, and most importantly, inside that group, I have to keep saying this, we help you build an ideal life. Not just have a job that makes money, but build a life with some freedom and flexibility so not only can you enjoy the money that you've made, um, but you can just have this, this, I don't, how do, if you ever seen the movie The Gambler uh, with Mark Wahlberg and John Goodman, I need to share it on my Instagram. It's a great movie. Um, it's a great, it's a good movie. I should say that. It's not a great movie. It's a good movie, but it's one of the greatest dialogues or like monologues, if you will, from John Goodman in there, where he says, you know, you get up two and a half million dollars and you do everything from a position of fuck you. And uh, I know that's harsh for a lot of people to hear, but our mastermind group helps people do things. If they do it right for a long period of time, you can start doing things from a position of fuck you, where nobody can tell you what to do. You don't have to take this job. You don't have to take that client. You don't have to go to this meeting. You can do what you want when you want because you've created this financial stability and freedom in your life. And uh, I'm very thankful and humbled to be able to sit here and do that where I don't have to do certain things I used to have to do. I do everything now from a position of fuck you. And that's like, you know, boss wants you to come into work today. Fuck you. You know, you got to take this client at four o'clock in the morning. Fuck you. Like all those. That's what I mean by saying that where you're in this position and you don't have to have $20 million to be there. You don't have to have $100 million to be there. You can do that with way less money than you think if you do it correctly and create an environment and an ecosystem where you're not, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, the, the buyer is, you know, as they say, the buyer is slave to the lender. That, that really is true. You don't want to be that. You want to be the person who has flexibility and freedom and has created wealth in your life. Now your money makes money, even when you sleep and you wake up and just things are rolling in. And that is what we help people do in our Build Different Mastermind group. So I want to throw that out there because I wouldn't be here today without the influence and circumstance that I have been surrounded with over the past 15 years living in Scottsdale and being able to just be surrounded by some of the, the most you know financially savvy people, but also um, people who create a, a great life for themselves um, with the money. And so it's not all about the money. It's more about the flexibility and freedom and, and happiness and being able to sleep at night. Uh, knowing that uh, you're not living on a string and it's all going to come crashing down if you don't get a paycheck next week. So 
Thank you guys, as always. If you're on Spotify, drop it a five-star. Uh, leave a message on the episode. I would appreciate it. If you're on Apple Podcasts, drop it a five-star. Leave a comment. If you want to share this with a friend, family member, maybe a kid that you got who uh, is trying to navigate this crazy time being a younger person, hopefully this helps and I can paint a picture for them of, of what reality looks like and what it was for me. And if you guys ever want me to go into way more detailed specifics on my stuff, I'm happy to do so. Um, they're full transparency here on everything. And if it helps you, uh, I'm happy to share. So have an amazing rest of your Wednesday or whenever you're listening to this on your walk or your ruck, or most importantly, hopefully as you do mobility, because you need it, especially as we get older, my friends. So have a great rest of your day. Whenever this podcast finds you, I'll probably hop on maybe the weekend, but most likely next week. My schedule's been crazy busy, but I'm trying to navigate it the best I can. It's been a crazy season of life for me, just as it is for many of you, and I'm just doing the best I can each and every day with what I have. So until next time, eat well, train hard, be nice to people, and please, you guys, keep doing shit you love with people you enjoy because your life is too short not to. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.